Manchester United will be disappointed with that result, especially after taking the lead, Karen. How gutted will they be to not come away with all three points and not to have killed the game off? Well, they walked off extremely disappointment and definitely felt the mood within the stadium. Um, I thought first half they were pretty good, controlled the game, um, obviously took the lead and went in. You thought, right, second half, make sure that, as you said, kill the game off, but kept them hanging in, kept them hanging in and credit to FC20, came back with a response and have come away with a point. But the good thing about this competition for Man United is there's a lot more time to make up on the points that were dropped tonight. But overall, disappointing. Yeah, what will the most disappointing thing about that second half performance be, Owen? Probably the fact that when they conceded the goal, which is a mistake from Ericsson, he you know, just lost sight of kind of where he was. The fact that the game got away from them. You can concede a goal, you can make a mistake, but then you got to push. And they didn't really create a ton, I think, after that. If anything, it felt like it's to, you know, they were the ones kind of that were going in confidence, obviously. And I think if you look at the bench and the players that Manchester United have, there was more than enough time to go, still go and win the game. The one thing you would have to say is the goalkeeper made two brilliant saves mm. today. Yeah. Two really important saves. But I think after the mistake from Ericsson, it just felt like the, the heads maybe went down a little bit. And you don't have time for that. You just got to keep pushing, try and find a way to get a goal back. In the first half, it did feel like Manchester United were in control of the game. Christian Eriksen with the opener for Manchester United. And it was a super strike, wasn't it, Karen? It was. It was fell to him so beautifully. And he just ran onto an absolutely clinical. But they dominated in the first half down his left-hand side. And it was partly because of Marcus Rashford. But nice little build-up. Dallow, who was excellent today, despite the result. He played really, really well, and it fell to Christian Eriksen really, really kindly. There's Dallow in that space there, tucking in, creating havoc. And they don't track Christian Eriksen. He's heavily involved in the build-up. It comes to Dallow, and look, there's Eriksen in the back there. No one picks him up. It absolutely smashes it. And sometimes when there's so many bodies around the 18-yard box, so many people there, if it falls to you, just hit it. There was a second-half chance of Bruno as well. Just get your strike off. But it was also nice to see the way United played in that first half. The two centre-backs centre were really almost in the middle of the opposition half. So it allows them to squeeze, allows Eriksen to get freed up because they can't mark everyone. But take nothing away from the strike. It was a brilliant strike from Christian Eriksen. At that point in the game, and as we were heading into the second half, it looked as though the game was only going to go one way, Owen. So why did it change? We'd have to say Twente played better. You know, they, they were probably a little bit more... Uh, opportunistic and again I think it was just the, the mistake really from Ericsson you know he made a mistake which you wouldn't normally see a player of his caliber make you know he just got caught in an area when people come on to you, you just got to pass the ball back to the goalkeeper uh, he just he just got caught on the ball and I think at this level you, you're going to get punished there was almost more than one mistake in the build-up to that yeah. goal defensively from United I mean it came from a goal kick and that actually is a dead ball situation here look this is a system error as well. Rashford but Marcus goes, does great to press, doesn't he? Does, he? he does double press, which I think that's great. But at this point there, when he can run through three, four players, you jump in, the space is there, your two centre-backs are out. And OK, it falls to Ericsson. I think he's worried about passing it back, doesn't check his shoulders. But from a goal kick to go from your, their goal kick to run through the heart of your team and to get an equaliser, for me, is a huge system error. And it's more than Ericsson's mistake. That's a huge system error for system error for Manchester United. No, you're right, and you see Eriksson there, we got him on the freeze. When you get there and the people are coming behind you, which you can't see, he doesn't check his shot, just pass it back. Pass it back to Onana. Dallas too close. Credit Lammers, you know, he, he puts it in at the near post. I think Onana probably look back at that and think, you know, should I maybe have covered the near post? But the one thing I would say is the right back did brilliantly. And he's almost in between all the Manchester United players. So it's like, are you going to get him? Are you going to Are you going to push? And again, it's just, it's, it's a couple of mistakes before that. And then they add up to a moment like that. It's a great finish, though, isn't it? He deceives Onana and just yeah. puts it in at the near post. And you've got to credit the FC Twente pressing in that goal. Absolutely. They don't give up on anything. And when you're still in the game at one end and you're thinking, I'm sniffing something out here, um, they took it. And fair play to them. And you're right, Jules, it was a great finish. Gave them the eyes and in the back of the net. And 1-1, one, one, they got a point now. Twenty then defended, didn't they, Owen? And they wanted to come away with a point. Manchester United did have their chances, though. If you look across the, the whole game, 19 attempts, five of them on target. So only five actually on target on the goal, Owen. Here were some of the, the big chances that Manchester United had. Why are they not putting these away? Well, to be fair, you're not, you, you're not going to be the goalkeeper, I think, from that angle. That's, I mean, that's really good football. Xerxes, I thought his hold-up play at times was pretty good. Shifts it onto his left, really good feet. But the goalkeeper was, was, was fantastic today. He made three or four really important saves. This was United really pushing. Um, 
And that was a really good bit of football. He's so unlucky, Bruno Fernandes, there. That is close. Just glides by. That almost went in the top corner. And this, this was the last one, kind of at the end of the game. Floated up for Harry Maguire. Can you win it? Second balls. And the goalkeeper again. He makes a, he makes a brilliant reaction save. He did that in the first half as well. But I, I just don't think they created enough clear cut. That is an excellent save, isn't good, it? He, from he made two. One in the first half and that one again. But I think for Eric Tenag, with all the firepower that Manchester United have and the players that came off from the bench, you know, Kobe Manu, Rasmus Hoyland, Garnacho, even though, what would you say, 19 shots, it didn't feel yeah. like a ton of them were, were that clear cut considering the firepower they had out there. We talked about it before the game, didn't we, Karen, that Manchester United are the team that have missed the most big chances in the Premier League this season. So this is clearly an ongoing issue. So how does Eric Ten Hag go about fixing it? Well, I tried to ask him that. And <laughs> you he did, and he, he wasn't me, didn't having me. any of it. He wasn't <laughs> having any of it. Because I was like, do you address it or do you actually go, say, from the Palace game? Actually, don't mention it. It'll come. We just keep doing the right things. We keep doing the right things. But I have to agree with Owen and watching those clip back, clips back, they weren't like huge chances. They were half chances. Um, so I, I I don't know, Jules, because I'm looking at their front players, I'm looking at the players coming on, and they've got the talent there. It's just not clicking and not gelling. And um, the runs in the final third again when the ball was hit across, across to Xerxes, and he's not quite there. It's just not clicking. And even I can't tell you right now. Um, it's just that inconsistency. Well, we'll hopefully get the thoughts of Eric Ten Hag very shortly. But for now, let's hear from Christian Eriksen. Christian, first of all, respect for coming out and facing the media in terms of after a difficult evening, what would have been for yourself, just overall. But there is positives and negatives to look at for your individual performance. So how do you reflect on the point? No, I think I'd be uh, mostly disappointed as a team. Uh, I think we, obviously, we wanted more, uh, but it was far from good enough. And uh, yeah, like just uh, being said also in the change room, I think they look like they wanted more than us and that can't be right. Um, and then yeah, personally, I think you score a goal and after you think of a match winner, but then obviously it's going to be the other way. What do you say as one of the senior members in that changing room? What's the sort of the mood and what sort of the points that you reflected to your teammates? No, I think there's uh, everyone is looking at themselves. I think foremost, it's uh, everyone is professional footballers. They know what to do and know what what can't happen. And a game like today, obviously we don't lose, but it feels like a loss. And uh, that's something that at home against Vente can't happen. Yeah, you can understand why it would feel like a loss, can't you? Interesting, actually, what he said there. He said, you know, they, in the dressing room, you know, people said that felt like they wanted it more, which is, um, yeah, obviously you can't have. I, I didn't really get that impression, really, that they wanted it more, but I just thought their, their energy and effort was probably, you know, peaked towards that second half. But I thought United just, I just thought their heads went down a little bit after that goal, after that mistake for Nerickson. And obviously he's right. It's not good enough. You know, at home, 1-1 one, one against a side like 20, do you expect them to win the game? Um, and, and they didn't get the job done. What do you think, Karen, of that? To hear that, yeah. that the other team wanted it more, you, that you can't hear that. You can't have that. Mm. Um, that's unacceptable, isn't it, really? You're, you're at home, you should win it more, you won a lot, you have to be ruthless. I didn't see a ruthless edge from United tonight. I think that's what I couldn't really articulate when you asked me a minute ago. I don't see the ruthless edge. I don't see, OK, if we're not scored, it's 1-0. Nothing else. Doesn't matter. We want it more than them. I don't see that. I don't feel that. And I've said to you at the start of the show, there's not enough credit in the bank for me to really, really trust that I can guarantee a Man United result. But there's no ruthless edge here. And that's, that's the difference. That's what he has to get out of his players because I didn't see it particularly in the second half. Where should that ruthlessness come from, though? Well, it comes from the match winners, you know, at the top of the pitch. Manchester United have always had those players over decades, the best of the best, you know, clinical finishers, goal scorers. Ruud van Nistelrooy, one of the best, you know, to, to ever do it. And I think you need probably somebody of that ilk in a game like that, where it's tied, where it's cagey. They can just get half a chance and smash it into the back of the net. You think about the firepower they have out there. Marcus Rashford, Garnacho, Bruno Fernandes, Mason Mount came on. They have so many attacking players, flair players, Xerxes. Somebody needs to step up with the goals when they desperately need a goal. But even, even possession-wise, I thought the game was still 50-50. So I think they need to use the ball a little bit better. But still, you'd like to think with the players out there, they should be creating more and scoring more. So you think they have got it in that squad? I think they do. I think they're still finding their feet. I think, obviously, Luke Shaw to come back into the side. Um, I think he'll make a huge difference. I think you're always going to make a big difference mm -hmm. in terms of athleticism. Uh, I thought Ugarte did okay in there today so I think there's more to come from this team but again 
one one at home against a side like Twente. That's that's not how you want to start your European campaign. Eric, another performance where you've played really well in parts, but you've come away slightly frustrated. I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah, when you are one up and you're controlling the game, but you have to finish it off and make the second. And now uh, we make a mistake, and the uh, opponent take benefit from it, and we're able to draw. And of course, then we are. Um, yeah, very frustrated. Yeah. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm starting to see a very clear identity with this Manchester United side. The game against Barnsley, the game against the first half against Crystal Palace, the first half here, very clear what you're trying to do, but you've been punished for one error. Is that frustrating? I think, yeah, of course it's one error, uh, but not from one player, it's like a team. Uh, uh, and a player from the opponent can run and dribble over the whole pitch almost, I'll say half a pitch, without stopping by any one of us. And we win him, but then of course you have to take control. But that he can come so far on the pitch, and that is there's no good, and that is uh, unacceptable. Uh, we should stop him uh, in the first moment and, and don't allow him. But that is only one situation. Uh, it was more that we didn't finish it off. Uh, we have to be more ball secure. We have to look for more moments where we can dominate the ball and speed up the game and go for a second goal. In terms of getting that second goal, Rasmus Hoyland off the bench again today. He's getting himself back to full fitness. Obviously, that's going to take some time, but having your main number nine available should be beneficial, should be good for you. Uh, I think main, uh, of course, he's, uh, they are all main, but Joshua is doing very good. Also, he created a very good chance. It was a brilliant shot, but a very good uh, stopper. But we are very pleased that Rasmus is back, of course. And, and now he has to come up into full fitness. Uh, full speed and yeah, he can score a goal, we know that. Um, he's very good in the box. Back on the training pitch, ready for Sunday? Yeah, we have to continue. Uh, tomorrow uh, we have to, to prep ourselves together and keep going. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Goal line in football is 1 0 to defend, especially. Um, but how do you reflect on the point now? The game is concluded. Well, we kept them alive and we are 1 0 up, uh, controlling the game. And then yeah, you have to to be consistent. Eh? You have to keep going in the second half. And uh, we dropped the level and yeah, we gave a goal away. When you look at the fluidity of your team, especially in the second half, what was it about the change in the momentum that why the 20 were able to get back into the game? As I said, it, uh, we, we didn't finish it off. Uh, we had to, to go for the second goal. Um, and so um, they stay in life and then we get punished uh, with a mistake from ourselves. Was it individual errors or was it a system error? What was it in terms of what you saw as to why you were able to allow 20 to get back into it? Nah, the, the goal is it's, it's team. Eh? It's a player of 20 can dribble over the whole pitch eh, without stopping by any one of us. And then we win him, eh, but eh, uh, we can't give a goal away like this. So where do you go now? What are some of the words that you say to especially some of the leaders and senior players in that changing room, just to regroup and to re-collaborate themselves going forward? Now? Uh, the, it's about, uh, we have seen, we had some, again, some good structures, but you have to do the consistency. Uh, you have to keep going for the whole game. And uh, once you are one nil up, uh, you have to go. Uh, you have to keep going and go for the second. There was a great point made on the broadcast by some of the pundits, both Owen and Karen both alluded to the fact that this is still a longer sort of structure in this league system, in the Europa League. So was that reiterated to the players? Obviously, they know that, but to allow them to understand that the European campaign still continues for them. Yes. Of course, eh, we uh, first game in, and it's very important. You get a win. Eric, thank you so much for the time. Well, Eric Ten Hag saying there that they only really have themselves to blame and that they dropped a level, didn't finish the game off. So whose fault is that, that they dropped a level? Is that the players or the manager? Um, obviously, it's a manager's responsibility at half time to make sure that they go out. But ultimately, it's the players on the pitch to say, look, 1-0, clean sheet mentality. We've had the last three games a clean sheet mentality and have that desire and push on again and don't let them back into the game. But it goes back to that ruthless edge that also is not in scoring, but also in clean sheets. And as you mentioned, the goal to concede was, was terrible. 
and a whole team aspect, not just Christian Eriksen. So it's massively disappointing. Um, and again, they'll have to go back to the drawing board and the narrative, unfortunately, for Man United continues yeah. again, Jules. Yeah, he said there as well, Owen, that it's about doing it consistently. This is something we spoke about, about the Crystal Palace game at the weekend. They played so well in the first half. We've seen it again here tonight. They were much better in elements of that first half than what we saw in the second half. So why does that keep happening? Why can't they do it for 90? No, that's a really valid question, Jules. And that's been the biggest issue for Manchester United is consistency. So they, they have moments where they can be really good. You made a great point. That first half against Palace was probably one of the best in a long time. But somehow they come away from a game. They could have lost that game as well, you know, if it wasn't for their own and double save. So that's the thing they need to address is consistency. And the one thing I think over the past couple of seasons you'd say, when it goes against them, they tend to go down a little bit even more and that even today you know you, the one nil up okay you need to get the second goal you don't you make a mistake and then it's one one and really the still I think it was 65th minute there's plenty of time to fight back and get a second goal especially here but they didn't do that and I think that would probably be the, the worrying thing for Tanag is the mm -hmm. fact that they when they have sex setbacks they need to bounce, bounce back quicker. And it is a worry for Eric Ten Hag because we speak about this consistently about that narrative Karen as well that he needs to keep winning in order to keep the fans on side and to ensure that he remains the manager at this club. They are unbeaten in four games. It's worth pointing that out. This isn't a defeat, although it may feel like it to some of the fans that were here in the stadium tonight. But when we look at what's coming next for them, these are tough games. None of these are easy. They've got Tottenham here at Old Trafford next at the weekend on Sunday. Then they face a tough trip to Porto, probably their hardest away game in the Europa League, followed by Aston Villa, Brentford, West Ham and Chelsea. Those are not easy games. How much pressure is he under? Well, my first thought is, what's his 11 going to be? You know, I said at the start of the show, considering the fixtures that were coming, maybe the rotation of certain players. Um, but when you rotate, you've got to get results. So really, the first thing I want to see is against Tottenham, who's he going to pick? Who's his consistent? Who's his reliable? Who is going to go and get him and say that? We're going to go and get a result against Spurs and set us on a positive win. Because you're right, Jules, it is four unbeaten, but it's still, like you mentioned as well, Owen, the opposition that they played, it should be beating them. It should be beating FC 20 tonight. I'm yeah. sorry, that's not a disrespect to 20, but I'm not being funny. You're at home, the squad you have, you should be getting three points here tonight in this competition. What does he need just to ease that pressure then, Owen, out of those results? Just wins, Jules, that's simple. At a club like this, you need to win. You know, you need to find a way to win, win games. Um, those fixtures are incredibly difficult because all those teams can play, you know, and there's some really tough ones away from home as well. So, look, when you play for a team like Manchester United, you need to rise to the occasion. You know, they've done it in some one-off games and some big games when they've been up against it. But they're going to be tested in, in those next seven games. They need to find solutions. Eric, you know, he sticks his neck out every time and, he, and he's honest. But the fact of the matter is... They need results. That's, that's all this business comes down to when you play for a top team is, is getting points. We talk about how many games they have. Just another one to add to that list. It's just been drawn now in the League Cup. Manchester United have got Leicester. They are at home for that one. Um, right, let's get some more reaction now. Let's get some reaction from the 20 side of things, shall we? They were celebrating like this was three points, like it was a win and fair play to them. Here's their goal scorer, Sam Lammers. Sam, that's how you return to the UK. I mean... You wanted to make a statement tonight, obviously being 20 and knowing how aggressive you guys are and scoring goals, but do you feel like you could have actually won that game? Uh, there was uh, spaces to uh, in the counter-attack too. If we played it a little bit better, we could have won. Of course, last 10 minutes it was a little bit a little bit tricky. We had to stay back and, and, and uh, defend the goal, but yeah, there were definitely chances to also take the three points, but yeah, of course, we're very, very pleased with one point. Would that have been an objective coming into this, to try to catch them in the transition, to try to counter-attack on a team like Man United? But in, I ask you, in the, in the second half, it seemed like you guys were in control of a lot of parts. Yeah, no, we're a team that want to play with confidence, with, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we want to play as well, but we know Manchester is a, is a strong team, Manchester United, so sometimes we have to drop back and, and wait for the counter-attack. That's, that's what we did, waited for a mistake, and uh, that's how we scored the goal as well. We had two or three other moments where we could have uh, uh, scored or played it a little bit better. But yeah, like I said, very pleased. And I know the stats guys online are going to be going crazy because your form away from home is just, it seems to be just that 10 in 10 now. <laughs> why, why is it that you seem to love scoring away from home? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Of course, yeah, as a player, you don't really notice this. But uh, yeah, I think there's not 
many better places away from home to score than, than Old Trafford. So, yeah, I enjoyed every moment of it. And, uh, yeah, we're going to celebrate in the dressing room. And finally, I'm going to ask you, because I can hear the celebration starting over my shoulder already. What does this mean to you and your teammates in terms of just starting off the campaign correct? Yeah, amazing. Of course, if you play away at, at Manchester United, you know it's going to be a tough game. Uh, if you can take a point or three points, it's like, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah, like I said, we're going to enjoy this moment because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a special, special night for us. But, yeah, we have to recover as well because uh, we play on the weekend again. Sam, congratulations. Thank man. you so much, man. Enjoy the break back. Thank you. Oh, what a great night for him, Owen. Scoring at Old Trafford as an away player, that must be an amazing feeling for him. Yeah, um, and to be fair, they deserved it. You know, they, they kept pushing. They were really positive. They had some, some brilliant fans and support here as well. But I think that overall, I think for Manchester United, they'll be disappointed, you know, today. Uh, not, not winning the game you'd expect them to win. I thought Marcus Rashford looked good. I thought Nugata looked good. But as a whole, you'd expect Manchester United at home in a game like this, as good as 20 played in the second half. United got to be winning games like this. Yeah, Karen, final word on United? Oh, dis disappointed, um, but looking forward to the next one now. OK. There isn't any of the, the patterns and the movements and the runs in behind and all that sort of stuff where you can go, well, he's made that run, so this guy will do this. And it's just, I think you said before, it's just off the cuff stuff at times. And it's, um, yeah. It, it's a worry. Yeah, you it's feel mad. like there's always been that pressure on Eric Den Hag. Has it mounted even more so now? Is he the man to, to take United on? Oh, I think the, the pressure's mounting, but I think deservedly so. He's been in that job now often enough to stamp his identity on the team in terms of kind of style of play, how I'm looking to play. You can talk about individuals, but are the structures right in terms of how he's setting the team? Well, I'm still not sure. Playing with two kind of holding midfielders, two number sixes and a ten, Bruno Fernandes, I don't think is the way forward. Christian Eriksen is clearly out of his depth and centre midfield. We know Casemiro uh, hasn't got the uh, legs to play there. I'm not convinced that Bruno uh, Fernandes in that number 10 uh, uh, position either. So I think he might have to change that kind of uh, midfield that might have to go against his natural philosophy in terms of uh, how he wants to play. But I'm not too sure that he sees it. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, so yeah, it is a it is a it is a big worry going forward. Has he lost the dressing room? No, I don't think so. I think the lads look at him and think he's yeah, a decent old skin. Not too sure that's enough though for a manager of Manchester United football club. I don't think he's inspiring those players. As a manager, you got to look as a player. You got to look at your manager and think, yeah, I'll, I'll follow him. He's got the answers. He can lead us where we want to go. He's smart. He's bright. He sees pictures. Yeah, you know what I mean. He's the he's the one for us. I'm not too sure that kind of sentiments in the dressing room in regards to their feeling towards Ten Hag, and the fans as well. They are frustrated at this point. And as you said, Richard, the fact that there was nothing after the game, there was no boo, and they were just. Yeah, we're, we're used to this at this stage, and that should not be the way Manchester United are. No, the, the demands have to be high. But when they see a team that just constantly produces that sort of performance, it's almost like, well, the manager accepting it. So we've mm -hmm. tried, we want the team to be different, we want the team to be more successful. But obviously, from within the club, they're quite happy and quite content with what they're saying. You're looking at like Bruno Fernandes, who's the captain of the club. He's had zero effect on the game tonight, apart from running around and throwing his arms in the air and that one shot towards the end. And even even that free kick in the in the last minute, thirty yard free kick, that's just selfish. He was never gonna score. But that's what United have become. They're just a team of individuals and they just I don't know, I just I find it really difficult to watch them and just think that's acceptable, that's where United are, because from our era we grow up and go, Well, they're the best team mm. in the world. They're mm -hmm fighting everybody, they're winning everything, and now all of a sudden they've just become this also-ran club. It's, um, it's, it's sad, I would say, for the United fans. It must be dreadful because it looks like they're miles away from getting anywhere near competitive again. Yeah, it is a tough one to understand, that is for sure. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back. When a tough night, you would think, for Christian Eriksen to have the strike he did in that first half and then what happened at the back, a bit of a mistake for that goal for FC20, Kenny. Yeah, it was. It was a yeah. We saw the good and the bad. Probably we saw his qualities, uh, Eric Sinan's deficiencies as well. Which I wouldn't hammer the player for that. He, the age that he's at, uh, yeah, you, you've got to suck a certain amount up. Now this is quality. We know this. A little bit uh, scratching ahead in terms of his original position. It's a little bit loose for a centre midfielder find himself in a left wing position. But he kind of follows the ball, and it's a brilliant finish. We know that. And I always feel this is where he's at his uh, most effective. Uh, Erickson in the last tour of the pitch. He's a clever little operator. He's got a, uh, he's got some a good array of passing in there, and he can finish uh, as, as we can see here. 
So that's the qualities which he has when he gets himself uh, high up the pitch. The problem for him is when Manchester United turn over the ball and he has to defend in that orthodox central midfield position, which he's been asked to play at the moment. And that's where you start to worry as a Manchester United player because he has got deficiencies there and it cost United tonight. Yeah, he was at fault for a goal, but was he the only one at fault for the goal, Richard? Um, I don't think so. I think there's maybe four or five players that get ran past. Um, Rashford is the first one. Fernandez half tracks back. Martinez gets pulled out of position. Eriksen is wrong. Maguire loses the tackle. And then this is the big mistake because it's the final mistake when he dwells on the ball. And a player of his experience, you would expect him to understand the situation that he's in, that it's a, a high-risk moment. Let's deal with this situation and get set again. But... I think this part through the midfield is far too easy. Um, we spoke about Eriksen and uh, Martinez in terms of his, his position. And when, when you get yourself in a situation where you've got two dangers, you take the most dangerous and leave the least, leave it, let, let him be. But Martinez decides to go even further deeper into midfield with the guy and allows that one yard where it allows the player to get past him and then... The goal comes. Yeah, and showed Onana did better there near post. I would not. I think he's sort of playing mm. playing a game there with the forwards. You know what I mean? Trying to convince him maybe he's gone one side. The other wouldn't be overly critical. The United goalkeeper. I just feel, when you have a situation where an opposition right back picks up the ball five yards outside his penalty box and travels unopposed. Uh, and reaches your left side of the centre half, then there's a real problem. It just kind of drives through the heart of your midfield. Rich makes a good point about Martinez being a little bit too impetuous again. But for me, again, it's Ericsson. That inability to shift his feet quickly <coughs> over five, ten yards and shut that door kind of cost United. You know, he does that efficiently at the start, then you don't have that kind of ripple effect, which, which, which happens afterwards. So, yeah, the good and the bad from Christian Ericsson we saw this evening. Tactically, are they set up in the right way? to get the best out of the personnel they have, Richard? I don't think so. I think everybody, not, not just myself and Kenny, but every pundit that does TV shows and does Manchester United games, they say probably wouldn't put Ericsson in a defensive position. But constantly he gets put in these defensive positions. So Kenny's talking about not being able to shuffle his feet quick enough to, to get across and cover five yard distance. That's not a surprise, we know that. That's so put someone who can do it in the right position. He doesn't put Bruno Fernandes in that position because he knows he can't do it either. And he leaves him alone in the, in the 10 role and he can almost do what he wants throughout a game, Bruno Fernandes. Ericsson gets highlighted because of that one mistake, but the whole system's wrong. You've got players in the wrong position. You've got Dallow coming from left left back pushing into central midfield and instead of taking the sixth position where Ericsson is and allowing him to go forward, Dallow ends up in the 10th position. And it just seems bizarre, it seems strange the movements that they make. The organisation, like, at times I'm watching it and you don't know whether it's a tactic for the game in terms of the press that they're doing, but you've got Bruno Fernandes sort of running from right to left. And Zerxi stood there and they, they criticised Ronaldo for not going forward on the press, not, not closing down goalkeepers. Well, they've bought a £45 million striker who tonight, it seemed, either wasn't asked to or didn't really want to. But there's just... You cannot you cannot put your finger on that with Man United because there is so much wrong in possession and out of possession. It's very difficult to, yeah. to point out. I, I think there's an argument now for actually Bruno Fernandes and Ericsson coming out of the team, both of them, and United not playing with a number 10, actually getting a third uh, central midfielder in there. I could see a situation with Ugarte in that holding position and two midfielders around them. Um, Main was an obvious one, and even Mason Mount as number eight. You know, a bit more athletic, more legs in the team, and it gives you a bit more of a concrete uh, base in that central uh, area at the pitch. At the moment, they're playing with two number sixes. One of them can't defend. Ericsson tonight, Casemiro can't do it now with his legs. Fernandez certainly can't do it. And Manu, who's going to play in there alongside Ugarte, if he keeps this system, wonderful footballer as he is, he's another player you want to push up the pitch who isn't the best defensively either. So for me, it's the structure. He might want to play with two sixes and a number 10, but with this squad of players at the moment, for me, there's an argument he's got to sacrifice the 10, and that means Fernandez is captain out of the team. That's the strong decisions we're talking about, strong management, Ericsson out of the team, and incorporating three more orthodox central midfielders in there. In there. That might be the better balance for Manchester United for me going forward. Yeah, change in that formation. Consistently, he has left Bruno Fernandez to his own devices, and, and you know he didn't take him off again tonight. Is Eric Ten Hag strong enough as a manager to make these changes, to take Bruno Fernandes out of there, to change up the formation? Um, 
It was obviously his decision to put Fernandez as captain. He stripped, I think, Harry Maguire at the time as club captain and, and put Fernandez. So, alongside his signings, he's one of his main allies. He's the one that he's chosen to be the leader. And he seems to have get a free reign in everything that he does. There doesn't seem to be much responsibility on him. I think when the going gets tough, he just gets thrown his arms around. There doesn't seem to be a it huge... Gets indisciplined. Yeah. And does that affect other players on the pitch? Like, well, from it's, your it's own it's experiences, if, if a captain is doing that? But it, it affects the structure of the team for a start. You know, if he's, if he's, if he's just mm. like a uh, rabbit in a headlight and just doing things spontaneously, he can't do that. You've got to work within the, yeah. the structure. But I think if the players look at any stage, I think it has been the case with Fernandes during his Manchester United career, and think he's not contributing enough, and they feel as if the only reason he's been kept on the pitch is because he's got the armband, and the manager isn't strong enough to take him off the pitch. Well, then the players won't look at the manager; they'll think he's weak. That's a, that's a weak manager, and then you're you're heading down the the drain. Then you know the man, the players are going to lose total confidence in the manager. Now we know the qualities that Fernandez has. He didn't show them this evening. He had a poor game, but he's still on the pitch for the whole of the 90 minutes and he was in terms of his moving his hands and pointing his fingers and that kind of gesticulating you take it to a point as the player but ultimately you have as long as you're backing up with performances players will suck it up so yeah personally for me I think he's in uh, danger because I feel as if Ten Hag like I said has to alternate the structure of the team and with Fernandes in the team I think it's very difficult to do that We saw at one stage tonight Casemiro was having a few words with Rude Minister <laughs> we don't know what he was saying but I do often wonder what influence or impact, I know it's, it's, it's quite soon, you know, it's the start mm. of the season, what influence can Ruud Van Nistelrooy have on this team and I suppose will he, will he be allowed to have it? Um, he will have a normal coach's sort of influence in terms of following through with the manager's message. So it's not going to be what he wants, it's going to be what the manager wants and, and he's the man to, the, to deliver the sessions and the, that message, I suppose. But it, you know, it don't look like they have leaders. I think if Bruno Fernandes is your leader and your captain, well, then you're struggling probably as a as a group to have that one person who... I don't know, I look at Garnacho sometimes and when Bruno shouts at him, he just looks like, I'm not really mm. listening to you, I don't believe you, because I think Garnacho thinks he's the best player on that team, so he doesn't have to worry about what other people say to him. And he probably is. And I think some people don't... I think at times they look and they say, oh, you should pass it, you should pass it. But he's passing to players who, who then again pass the side But At least he wants to do something. He wants to make something happen. I think Diallo's similar to that. He gets on the ball. He wants to make chances happen. And I think there almost needs to be a trust in the team that you allow those young players to go and do their thing and the rest of the team be solid. Instead of it being, well, Bruno needs to get his little bit of joy and have a shot here and there and a free kick here and there. They just need to go... Like Kenny says, maybe just become a solid eight or whatever it is behind the ball and allow that front three to go and deliver and go and take chances. We saw that with Granacho, <clears throat> you know, coming off the bench. He had that urgency about him, that want, he tracks back. You know, he, he, you want that in all the players, but you could see it from him. He, he yeah. has that passion but and I think enough. that's what they're missing. Yeah, he, him delivering nine out of ten performance we now in the end of the season isn't going to get Manchester United into the top four. It's more kind of rooted than that. This is mm -hmm. what we're talking about. It's a kind of structure of the team which he needs to get right. It's, it's out of sync, it's out of kilter at the moment. The manager ha has to fix that. I think Garnacho and Diallo to a certain extent will excel really in any kind of environment. But for the team as a whole to progress and make, the, make that leap into that top bracket clubs that we spoke about, City, Arsenal and Liverpool, the fundamentals uh, have to change in terms of the, the balance of the team. And that's the responsibility of the manager. And I agree with Rich, they might have to become more of a, um, a counter-attacking team in terms of maybe sitting a bit more deeper uh, behind the ball, being a little bit more defensively secure, getting that extra midfielder in there to do that, and using they have got pace on the counter attack. Garnacho, Diallo, even Rashford at his best is a real threat on the counter attack. So that may be a way for this. Is what, the, what I'm talking about, the manager in the modern game, managers have their own philosophy. They only play a certain way. They live and die by it. Well, at the moment, this man's going to die uh, on his shield playing this way if he doesn't change things quickly. I think he has to see it. He has to recognise it. Van Nistelrooy has to be strong as coaches mm -hmm. after they see it and, mm -hmm. and tell them, put it straight, and something's got to change there at the moment because they're just kind of stumbling along at the moment. I think one of their best performances under Ten Hag was the FA Cup final against Man United or against Man City. And I think when Man United accept that they're not the best team with the ball and you just sit back and they get in their positions and, like Kenny says, they work with what they've got, they're actually not bad and they can beat most sides because disciplined side 
an organised Man United have got some really talented players, but when they're asked to be in possession, to try and break down those lesser teams, like a, maybe a Crystal Palace at the weekend, the 20 tonight, and they're in possession, they don't know what to do with it enough. They don't have any um, organisation and cohesion. Look disjointed. They look disjointed. Mm. They look like everyone's not really sure whose job Hesitant they're supposed to the be doing. on the ball at times, yeah. Yeah, and if they do, if they can ex But I don't think the fans will accept Man United being a, a counter-attack counter team. And it's like when they go and play Bournemouth, you expect United to go and break them down and they don't mm. seem to be able yeah, to do it. Yeah, but you look at Lucas Larson at the moment who are pushing Manchester City all the way. <clears throat> not, Arsenal have absolutely no problem at times for Pierdius Jordan game sitting back into that deep defensive block and looking to uh, almost like take a breather and hit teams on the counter-attack with the pace they have mm. kind of down the flanks. So they can break out quickly and they do that because they have confidence in their defensive structure they trust each other when they sit behind the ball you're not going to be able to get through us we're, you know, we're going to be able to defend for long periods Manchester United playing 4-4-1-1 at the moment with that kind of team they can't do it if they're going to drop into that deep defensive block, they've got to tinker with it. They've got to get that five, flat five in midfield, that back four, and then maybe go from there. That's what I'm, t uh, that's what I'm talking about. And your Manchester United Spurs might have to accept that. That's smart for me. That's a smart move from manager, making that kind of alteration, that kind of change, realising this is all I've got at the moment. How can I get the best out of this group? What best suits them? This may be not be the way I want to play, ideally, in the medium to long term, but it's going mm. to serve us well at the moment. He might have to do that, make those. And they're not just small adjustments. They're like significant adjustments to the team. I don't, I'm not too sure he's prepared to do that. Well, we did speak about Harry Maguire before the game, if he was going to start or not. He started and he did have a chance to get Man United second goal. Yeah, he's, but he's always got this threat, Maguire. It's always kind of floated to him because they know he's going to outjump uh, his man. He does the right thing, just throws a header back uh, across the guy. I actually thought he had a steady game tonight, uh, Maguire. Didn't make too many mistakes. It was interesting. Martinez, as a woman, was kind of worrying me this evening. He's, he made some really strange decisions, was really kind of loose in his defence. I know Rich alluded to it before the game. Rich hasn't got a huge amount of confidence in him, and that was a little bit of a worry. This is typical Maguire. Probably knows he can score, just heading it back across the goal. And he is a threat in the opposition penalty box. We understand that. But it's the other parts of his game, which he kind of gets found out in terms of his kind of athleticism, his kind of recovery speed. You know, that's a big worry he always has been, and that's why, obviously, he's not going to be first choice centre-half uh, going forward. But I'd never doubt his application, McGord, I'd say that good character, puts the jersey on, he always gives his best. Unfortunately, his best isn't quite good enough in this Manchester United team. Well, who did impress you tonight, then, from a Manchester United um, point of view, Richard? I think Diallo is is good. I think he's he's... he's always plays well, you know what he's going to do, he's going to try and take people on. There was one situation where he probably kept the ball on his left-hand side too, too much and if he had a switch foot, he might have got a foul over. I think Garnacho's very good. I look through their, their signings and I think since he's come in, I think Masraoui is a, is a really good full-back and he's, all right. he's going to play all the time. The rest of them are sort of in and out and tonight I know Delict's not playing but he couldn't get his game for Juventus, he couldn't get his game for Bayern Munich, and all of a sudden he's good enough for Man United. Um, and you I look think, at Xerxes, £35 million. Pound. So he's the big one for me, he's the one that has to work for United, because Hyland's a bit hit and miss at the moment. Xerxes, £40 million, pound. he said he's not a 9, he said he's not a 10. He's a 9.5, that's is, what he said. Which is a worrying sort of position in that team, but there was really, really good flashes of him tonight, so good shows. Holds up the ball, moves into good positions. He's outnumbered an awful lot of the time. This is the one which is interesting. He's a good centre forward, gets in front of a centre half and waits for that ball coming into the box. And he's a little bit reactive, which then, yeah, he maybe isn't an official number nine. I think sometimes when he gets it in, in these positions, is he a number 10? <laughs> not, not, I don't know. But it, it doesn't fill you with a lot of confidence if he's no, not I think sure if he's a hard, nine or ten. No, I think it'd been too harsh with the all nine and a half and going to ridicule him there. No, that's, that's, that's his own words. Yeah, that, that was, was his own words. Yeah, well, I was looking at your Kenny. face. If you can't see your face while you're saying it. So <laughs> that, that was his words. Yeah, that but he's, come, he's a big lad. Okay. You look at him initially, you think he's an orthodox number nine, crash, bang, wallet. But he's not. He's actually got twinkle toes. He's got soft feet. And I think he can link the play up. That's why they're talking about not a kind of nine and a half. So that's a good thing. He can drop off the front. He can link things up. You saw a couple of examples of it there. Of course, he's got to get into the box and get 
get on the on the end of things. Do you not need an out and out striker. Yeah, well, he's, he's got an he is an out and out striker in terms of his movement. Rich spoke, he's making the right there to the right run there to the near post. Just didn't arrive there. He's had chances this year, hasn't taken. If you can get yourself into the right areas time and time again, he's got to be a clinical finisher, a very good finisher. Now he hasn't shown that this season. Hasn't converted enough the chances that he has. I think Hoyland is the answer. You have to persevere uh, with Hoyland. But for me, this lad looks like an orthodox centre forward. He's comfortable up there. You have to chip in with fair share of goals. Don't get me wrong. But I genuinely think he's a good all-round player. He's he's not my worry at the moment because he's been brought in as a number two striker. So I'm happy with him. He's the least of our worries, Manchester United, at the moment. So what is it all about rotation now and keeping the, the players happy? I know Eric Tag has said that. But obviously 11th now in the Premier League. It's the start of the Europa League. But this is a massive loss for them. You'd think they'd want a good run in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I think the way the competition is set up when they... When they get going, United will qualify for the next round anyway, I would have thought, because of the fixtures they've got. But I think United need to find a style of play. We've seen with Chelsea in a club which is classed as crazy, absolutely all over the place. You can see within two or three weeks now exactly what they want to do, how they want to play, how they want to build up, how they want to defend. We've seen it with Tottenham. It, it, Tottenham's a little bit one of those... I, some people like how they play, some people don't, some people think it's too risky, but yet they have an identity. We're still waiting for this United team to get an identity, and I think if you keep rotating players, keep rotating your positions and all that stuff, you're not going to find it. So I, if I, I think for the owners of Man United, they need to go, right, listen, for the next three months, show me what you've got, show me your best team, show me your best system, and then we can make a decision on you, because I have no idea what he's trying to achieve at the but moment. I think this is, this is what he believes is his best system. You know, back four... Two, two in midfield, number 10, and obviously a front three. I just don't think with the players in the squad at the moment, it best uh, complements them. I think they're t uh, too open for the reasons that we're saying, and we're not really seeing that real kind of punch in terms of an attacking threat either. But that's, that's after a lot of money spent. That's his team now. That's not like... Yeah, he's well, man who comes look, look, there's players who can come in. A shot mm. comes in for me, improves that team. Man who comes in at the expense of Harrison and improves that team. But I still don't think the balance is right in that central midfield with, with uh, Mainu and Ugarty in there with that number 10, Fernandez or Harrison, take, take your pick. So that's what I'm talking about. It's how the manager sees it. He's got to live and die by those decisions. But at the moment, this is how he feels is the best way forward for Manchester United. I'm not convinced. You said ahead of the game that you wanted your players to be more ruthless going forward. Was that the same problem tonight? Yes, I think. A patch and especially you have to finish off the game. And we we kept them alive. And after we uh, we are one up, and you have to finish it, uh, make the second goal. Then then the game is dead. Now we kept them alive and they had a comeback in the in the game. What is more frustrating, the fact that you created chances without killing it, or that the equaliser was? I suppose it was a mistake, really, wasn't it? Definitely a mistake, but the football is is a game of mistakes. And uh, let's start with this. And it was a team eh, over uh, our left side that can play from front and can dribble out four or five players. Uh, that isn't possible. And then, of course, also yeah, we had to score. Um, we had to make the second goal. Then eh, the game is over. I suppose the one benefit of the expansion of this competition, the eight games now rather than six, not picking up a win tonight is less damaging than it might have been in the old format. Yeah, but uh, I'm not thinking of in this moment about this, uh, but of course that will, that will count uh, in a uh, continue of, of this um, Europa League. Uh, format when we uh, so when we go on, but in this moment I only think about yeah, the the performance. Uh, what was uh, what do we have to improve? Uh, where do we have to be more consistent? And that is about yeah, building uh, good structures, uh, creating changes. But we have to kill them. On a personal note, obviously it was a special night for you, a club who you shared so much history. With. Did you have chance to enjoy it? Will you get chance to enjoy the occasion? The fact that it was twenty. No, in this moment I'm, I'm, I'm with my team. And we are, uh, we want to improve and we want to make it a successful season. So um, there is not a place for a sentiment like this. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Well, that was a bit of a tough question to, to ask him there at the end. A bit of a silly one, maybe. You can hear the disappointment, the frustration, and almost like you know he can see it himself. He knows what's going wrong. Not, um, not too sure he can see it. Um, if he's talking about we need to be more ruthless in that game, that implies that 1-0 up, they had six or seven clear-cut chances. They didn't. 
they never got into the position where they, they could be rooted, didn't create enough chances in terms of the quality of their football in the opposition half the pitch. So I don't agree with that. And he specified it there in terms of the goal they conceded. An opposition player can't run, you know, 50 yards down the pitch unopposed, albeit Ericsson made a mistake at the end. So you have to ask yourself, well, why did that player run 50 yards down the pitch? The reason is because of the deficiency in the team, the setup of the team. Ericsson's inability to move his feet quickly and make tackles in that central area of the pitch for me, that was a big fundamental why they conceded. Now he's picked uh, Christian Ericsson that central area of the pitch. So you might have to, I think he has to take responsibility for that. And if he continues to play Christian Ericsson there, he's still going to be making those mistakes and he's still going to be making, having these conversations after the game. So he needs to recognise that quickly and make the kind of adjustments that we're talking about to the team. It's really it's that, that those, those kind of decisions are on him, purely and simply. Yeah, he'd mentioned there as well, consistency. And I suppose that is key and it's something we haven't seen with Manchester United. No, not seen it for years at Man United. That's been their, one of their biggest problems. And I think it comes from the team that he picks, the, the, the rotations that he makes, the, the different demands that he, he's putting on the players. Um, it's just, it's hard, I think, because sometimes I listen to Ten Hag and I listen to his reviews of games and it's almost like he's, he's watched a different game. I agree with Kenny, they've not been able to kill the game off, not because they've missed chances, mm -hmm. because they haven't created that, they haven't done that. And we showed the highlights there at the end of the game and it's a Harry Maguire scruffy header, which almost wins, but that's as far as it goes. There's nothing, there's nothing dominant or, or nice about what they've done all evening. So there's loads of problems um, for Ten Hag. Um, he'll keep spinning it in his favour the whole time, but the, the truth we can all see every time they play a game, they're not getting any any improvement over where they were when he first took over. Yeah, well, that is all we've got time for this evening. Another tough night for Manchester United at Old Trafford. My thanks to Kenny and to Richard for joining me. We'll be back again tomorrow night. See you then.